In this lesson, we're going to carry on working through our summer 2018. It is paper 21, so a short answer paper. We're working now from question three. Researchers isolated a sucrase enzyme from the bacterium Bacillus subtilis. They immobilized the enzyme in alginate beets. So this is most definitely an enzyme question. The researchers investigated the effects of temperature on the activity of the immobilized sucrase compared with the activity of the same enzyme free in solution. So we're getting an idea now that we're working with stability. Okay, because obviously if an enzyme is immobilized, we would think that it's more stable, so then maybe it can last at higher temperatures than that free enzyme. And if we look at the results, okay, shown in figure 3.1, we've got a beautiful graph. Along the horizontal axis, we've got temperature in degree C. On our vertical axis, we've got percentage of maximum enzyme activity. And we can see clearly that maximum enzyme activity, 100%. So enzymes doing their maximum is here at just around 60, so our optimum temperature. So they both go up together, so free and immobilized, but the downward trend is a little bit more interesting because look here at the bottom with this split. When we get up to 80 degrees C, that immobilized sucrase on the alginate beads is far more active than the free sucrase. The free sucrase is not active at all. We're all the way down to zero. So there's definitely a difference, a major difference at higher temperatures. We then look at the question. Question asks us, with reference to figure 3.1, so you're going to have to say some data, compare the effects of temperature on the activity of immobilized sucrase with the activity of sucrase free in solution. So they want us to compare, okay? So it is not just it goes up, it goes down. We need to compare immobilized with free. So we've identified these three zones. We've identified an up, an optimum, and a down. We've got a together the same and different. So that's then how we're going to construct our answer. So we have a, a structure that we're working through rather than just throwing words. So if we look at where they're starting, we've got 10 little blocks, I believe, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, and 20. So we're going up, 20 divided by 10 is in twos. So, 60, 62, 64, 66, 68, 70, 72, 74, this is now at 76. So they're both 76% at 40 degrees C, going up to 100% at, here we're going five blocks for five. 141, 2, 3, 4, 5, yes, perfect. Always take the time. Okay, you don't want to be reading your graph and then getting your scale wrong. So you always want to take that time to make sure you've read your scale right. So one, two, three, four, five. This is actually bang on 60 degrees C. So they're increasing together from 76% at 40 degrees C to 100% at the optimum temperature, 60 degrees C. Okay, so... Activity increases for both immobilized with a double M and free enzymes from seventy six per cent at 40 degrees C to 100% at 60 degrees C. So we've now got that similarity bit out of the way. Now it's about the difference bit. So decreasing. 
So above 60 degrees C, activity decreases. But it's more steep, remember they like that word steep, okay? More steeply for the free enzyme than the immobilized enzyme. They go all the way down to zero. However, here's our comparison that immobilized sucrase is still at two, four, six. We're actually between. So here we're at 27%. Still got 27% of the maximum activity in that immobilized sucrase. And there is our final comparison. So they're both going up, they're both hitting at 100%, but they're coming down differently. And at that highest temperature, we have far more activity in the immobilized enzyme as we would expect. We continue with our story of the enzymes. The researchers also investigated the effects of pH on the activity of the immobilized sucrase compared with its activity in free in solution. The results are shown in figure three, two. So again, we have a similar thing. Percentage of a maximum activity, zero to 100, and then we have pH along the bottom. We've got our immobilized with the X's and our free with the dots and circles. Little reminder, Remember that pH seven is your neutral, so these are acidic. And up here, we will be going into basic, but this here is our neutral. So if we look at it, this enzyme is actually working at relatively acidic pHs. As we get towards the basic, towards neutral, this free sucrase is really, really dropping steeply, whereas the immobilized sucrase is far more stable. And it makes sense because pH is affecting those hydrogen bonds, the weak bonds. But if we can hold our enzyme stable in this immobilization, then we don't have as much of an effect from the pH. So figure 3.2 shows that immobilized sucrase remains active over a wider range of pH compared with sucrase free in solution. We absolutely agree. Suggest reasons for the higher activity of immobilized sucrase over the range of pH between 5.5 and 8. So we are looking at this zone here. And they are asking us to suggest reasons. So this is not description. This is now reasons why is that immobilized sucrase at that higher activity. And as we just said, immobilized, immobilization is going to stabilize the enzymes. So the bonds are going to be less disrupted, particularly those hydrogen bonds and ionic bonds that are affected by hydrogen ion concentration. So immobilization stabilizes the enzyme
So the shape of the active site is less disrupted by changes in pH. What does that mean? Okay, and it's at a more different level. We're actually talking about those bonds within the enzyme. We're talking about the fact that the bonds aren't broken. The enzyme is not even denatured. See here, the free enzyme is denatured at a pH of eight. The immobilizer is still at 40% of maximum activity. So, fewer bonds within the enzyme are broken and therefore even at pH 8 the immobilized enzymes are not fully denatured. So we've never studied this in specifics, but we are using knowledge that we have about enzymes and bonding and the effect of pH and stabilization and why we would do immobilization of enzymes and we're tying this all together in order to suggest reasons. A straight explain question would be explaining a process that you have learned. So therefore you must know all the technical details. Here is a suggesting a reason, it's a suggest question, but this reasoning is this explanation of why. So we've talked about temperature and pH. C, state one variable that the researchers should keep constant in both investigations and explain your answer in terms of enzyme action. So we've looked at pH and we've looked at temperature. What else must be kept constant? Well, concentration of the substrate, concentration of the enzymes. All those are the factors that are going to affect enzyme reactions. So let's go with concentration of substrate must be kept constant. They've only asked us for one, so we're only going to deal with one, even if we've got more in our minds. We can make a little note of them. But our answer is just the one. Okay, so why is it important that the concentration of substrate is kept constant? It's because that concentration influences the probability of collisions. It influences the probability of that enzyme substrate complex forming. And that, of course, influences the reactive reaction. Okay, we want to be technical. We want to use as many technical terms in here as possible because this is a distinct explanation question. Whatever you're explaining, it's all about technicalities. Last part of this enzyme question, there are many advantages of using immobilized enzymes in industry. Suggest two advantages of using immobilized enzymes in industry other than 
remaining active over a greater range of pH. So obviously they've given us pH, we can't use it again. We need to think of other things. Okay, well, they didn't tell us we can't use temperature. And we've also looked at temperature. And when we looked at temperature, we discovered those immobilized enzymes were stable also at higher temperatures, which could be good in the production process of whatever it is these enzymes are involved in producing. So immobilized enzymes. are stable at higher temperatures. The other big one that we talk about a lot when we talk about milk um, and lactose-free milk, it's about the fact that when you've got your enzymes on these beads, we can use the enzymes over and over again. They're not going into that two liter of milk and being sold. We can use them to use on the next batch of milk as well. So one of the big benefits of immobilization of enzymes is the ability to reuse them. So immobilized enzymes can be reused. Now we've only used half of this line available, but we've given two solid points. So we're actually gonna stop there because they only asked us for two. We could talk about the fact that if we're using immobilized enzymes, we're not contaminating our product with the enzyme. We don't have to then go through this process of removing the enzymes from the product. You don't want milk full of enzymes. Now you've removed all the lactose, but you've added in the enzymes. We don't want that to happen. So an advantage of an immobilized enzyme is that you don't have to do further refinement post-production, for example. But they've only asked us for two. The instructions are critical. You always follow instructions. So we stop at two. And we move on to our next question. So figure 4.1 is a ribbon model of a molecule of hemoglobin. And we can see they've got various things labeled. You can see E is a chemical group is, that is not made from amino acids that must be a prosthetic group, we rather think that's going to be heme. F is a form of secondary structure found in the polypeptides. Let's actually make notes of these as we go through this, understanding this diagram. Form of secondary structure found in the polypeptides in hemoglobin. And we can see here that we have a coil going on. Now, secondary structure, alpha helix and beta beta sheet. This is now an alpha helix. G, each polypeptide is folded to form a complex three-dimensional shape. Well, that then is your tertiary structure. H, each polypeptide is made of a sequence of amino acids. The sequence of amino acids, there's your primary structure. And each hemoglobin molecule is composed of four polypeptides shown here by different shading. Well, that is quaternary. So you can see in this case, being very familiar with your levels of protein structure, you can also get a good idea of why hemoglobin is such a wonderful protein to study. So, A, state the term that matches each of the descriptions given in boxes E, F, G, H, and J in figure 4.1. Well, that's fantastic because we've already done that just in getting to know the diagram. So E was the heme group. And then we can see F is our alpha helix. G is our tertiary structure. H is our primary structure. And J is our quaternary structure. Spelling is important. As with any technical terms, it is really critical that you get everything spelt correctly. So, moving on, 
we see we have again another graph and a lot of information. So we're going to save this question for the next lesson. So we can do it properly. Questions like this, when you have lots of information, as with our enzyme question, just coming back to recap, it's really important that you take the time to go through the information because all the information that is there in the question is there to help you answer. So whenever you've got information, read it thoroughly. Underline, make notes, whatever it is that you need to really get to grips with that information. As we did, whenever you've got a graph, check your scales, check your units, make sure you're reading things correctly. Look at just understanding the shape of the graph and starting to think about why the graph might look like that before you then go on and actually look at the questions and answer the questions. Because the more familiar you are with your source material, the information and the graphs, then the easier it is to answer the question. Whenever you are asked for reasons, for explanations, make sure you get technical. Then always follow the instructions. If they ask for one thing, if they ask for two things, do that. Okay, you're not going to get extra points for putting in extra things. In fact, you're running the risk of losing marks because at the end of the day, writing more is taking more time. And that's time that you then don't have to spend on other questions or checking your work at the end. So always follow the instructions. And take the time to really get to know a diagram because it can save you time then in answering the questions. Make sure you are familiar with protein structure. It comes up over and over and again, year after year after year. They're asking questions in Multiple choice in short answer, in practical, it can come up anywhere. But it is one of those things that you need to be very, very, very proud.